We're All cheering right. you on, Brett, so don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. We got your back. Awesome. So whenever right. you're ready to start, go for it. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to our PCA, our Positive Coaching Alliance um, Double Goal Coaching Workshop. Um, if you haven't done so yet, please text to sign in and um, enjoy this free resource, The Power of Double Goal Coaching. A lot of what we'll be going over today um, is just taken right out of this book. It's going to be a great resource. I encourage you to read it. Um, don't use it as a coaster, but read it, digest it, share it. Um, it has a lot of amazing principles um, to offer. And today, like I said, um, we're going to be doing this workshop style because I don't lecturing for me. It's personally boring. Uh, boring. And if I spoke the whole time, um, you guys will probably be sleeping as well. So we're going to get interactive. We're going to get to know one another. Um, we're going to make this as fun as possible. So again, thank you um, for showing up tonight. And like Kelly said, um, my background is um, I got to play college sports. Um, I got to play college baseball at Pacific University up in Oregon. A huge privilege. And um, can I just say that? I wish I was sitting in your seats. Um, if I found out anything about what this book had to offer, what double goal coaching, what PCA was all about, I can guarantee you that um, throughout my baseball career, I would have had a lot more fun. I would have enjoyed the game a lot more, and I probably would have been a much better player. So again, get excited for what we're going to be going over because um, this is huge because you have the power to change the youth sports culture that we're living in right now. And before I really get into it, I just want to take care of this misconception that, you know, PCA, it's soft. It's, oh, it's, you know, make a, give him an award for every mistake he makes or they're not about winning. That's not the case. My, my goal here tonight is to share with you principles that are going to help your team get more wins, and to end up winning on the scoreboard. But in doing so, um, that's not my only goal. My goal is also to help you develop better people and to better athletes. So better people, better athletes, and winning, it's a trifecta. It's perfect. Um, it's the big three. So what I want to kind of start with, does anyone recognize this picture, or does this look familiar to anyone? Yeah? And so, I mean, what do you guys know about it? Um, I've seen it before in a magazine, and I think it was related so to something like sportsmanship. That's right. That's right. Kelly? Yeah, I just remember that it won a big award because it was so shocking that an opponent would help another girl across the um, cross home plate. So it was. It made, we won this big award. Exactly. So to kind of get everyone's memory um, refreshed and to get the whole story, I'm going to go ahead and play this video. But... We're going to skip it for now because I ran into technical difficulties. It's not playing. Not so I'll just show you real quick. Um, back in 2008, um, there was a conference championship softball game going on between Western Oregon University and Central Washington University. Um, this girl, Sarah, knocked a ball out of the park, her first home run of her career, not even her collegiate, but her entire softball career, right? Goes over the right center field fence, and as she's turning first, she's so excited, she misses the bag. So she pivots to go back, but then start just falls flat on the ground, tears her ACL, and is crawling back to the bag, just hugging it. The umpire says, you know, if any teammates come to help, um, she or if anyone goes to sub in, it's just going to be a two-run single. And so um, the opponent, the girl standing right by, her name was Mallory, she actually led the entire conference in home runs. She's hit more conference um, she actually set the record for home runs in the conference in a single season throughout her career. And she sees that, and she asks the umpire, is it okay for them to carry her around? And so her and her teammate carry Sarah around each bag. They touch each bag to the home plate, and it counts as a home run. And it's such a beautiful story. And like Kelly said, it won a big award. Um, it won the best moment in the 2008 ESPY Awards, awards um, for you know sports on ESPN. And, um, I mean, what do you guys think about just a moment like that? Because it's a special moment, like you said, about sportsmanship and about just the game, the game of sports. I would just be so proud if that was my players. That's right. Just so excited for them to make that yeah. decision without me telling them as their coach. And the coaches were. The coaches were. So and if a, if a player doesn't do that, does that mean that they aren't sportsmanship-like? I guess that's the word I would ask. You know, if I can come back to that in a little bit, because that's a really good question, really good question. Um, but at PCA, rather than looking at, at that side of the story, we want to focus on that this was probably one of the greatest examples 
of taking sportsmanship to its highest level, what we call honoring the game, which is actually our third principle um, in what it what it means to become a double goal coach. And so what honoring the game me. does, it, it gets to the roots of positive coaching, right? And the acronym ROOTS um, stands for, um, well, I'll go over it in a little bit, but it focuses on five key areas that we respect within the game itself, whether you're playing football, soccer, basketball, baseball, swimming, five main areas that we respect the game as a whole. And so can anyone guess what the R stands for? Respect. Respect. That's it. That, good guess. Good guess. <laughs> Everybody R always says that, by the way. <laughs> Kilo was telling me about that. <laughs> but um, the R actually stands for rules. Um, and that idea is that we follow the letter and the spirit of the rules and as a double goal coach, as a part of PCA, we refuse to ignore or to violate the rules because if we're winning um, by cheating, um, by bending, by finding loopholes, I mean really what kind of value of a win or does that bring to the victory? And at PCA, um, we feel it's not enough just to um, respect the letter of the rule, but the spirit of the rule as well. Um, can anyone take a guess at what our first O stands for? I think maybe it could be officials. Officials, you're you're one step ahead of the ball game. But this mm -hmm. one, the first O is going to stand for opponents. And I don't know, have any of you seen the movie um, Karate Kid? Mm, yeah. Right, really good movie. Um, and and martial arts is actually pretty big in Hawaii. And what you'll see is that before the competitor or the fighter enters the mat, enter the dojo, they bow to one another. And what that ball communicates is that, hey, I respect you as my opponent. I respect you as my competitor. And it's also saying, hey, bring it on because your best is going to draw the best within me. And that's actually a gift. Having an opponent as a sport team, it's a huge gift because it draws out the best within us. And you might have seen this played out when if, if you coach at the high school or collegiate level. Um, when you're playing the number one team in the state, the number one team in your conference, it naturally draws out the best within you. It draws out the best within your players. Um, if you're in the community league and you're in your state tournament, obviously, hey, this team is in the championship with us. It's going to draw out the best within them. So having an opponent and respecting the opponent is such a big gift. And, and you know, at PCA, this is where the misconception can get um, seen as soft, but we believe in fierce and friendly competition. I mean, you look at football, if I need to go sack the quarterback, I'm, as a coach, I'm going to hit him, but, you know, you help him back up, right? Fierce and friendly. So we view the opponent um, as an opponent and not an enemy um, because there's no place for hatred and competition. And really, what kind of message, um, what kind of a wrong message would we be communicating for our players to hate other players just because of a uniform they wear in the back or, you know, the school they come from or the community that they live in? And so... The next one, you, you nailed it right on the head. It, it is officials. And um, how many um, perfect officials do we have in this world? <laughs> Zero. Me. Right. Zero, right. <laughs> one, right? <laughs> and so why, I mean, seriously, officials, they make mistakes all the time. And, and why? Because I used to think they just make mistakes because they're sleeping on the job. Mm. Mm. They're human. <laughs> they're human, exactly. Yeah. They're a human being just like you, um, just like me. And um, so what we want to focus on is really how can we disagree in a way that's going to respect our officials because um, youth sports is, is losing officials at an alarming rate. Yeah. It's yeah. scary. And without officials, we can't play the games. These students can't or these players can't play the game. And so how many of you guys have ever officiated a sport before? Mm -hmm. right, all of us here. And um, as an official, how would you want you know, players, coaches, even parents to approach you? I want them not to scream at me. Yeah, I'm trying to scream, make decisions. Two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I stopped officiating basketball because the players were too close and the oh. coaches were too close. At least if I'm out on a lacrosse field or a field hockey field, I got some distance. When mm -hmm. you're in a gym and they're ten feet away from you in the stands and they're screaming at you, it, oh. I just I couldn't concentrate. So well, I'm just that. I gotta maybe now I know if I have to officiate, just put earplugs. Exactly. I, <laughs> I mean, as officials. We've all been there. We've worn their shoes. But, yeah, this, the yelling, the constant yelling, they're in your face. And if it's bad breath, like, oh, that's just another negative. <laughs> but, I mean, how can we begin to respect and honor officials? Because even the way we coach, it trickles down and it communicates the way we want our players to play the game as well. And so can anyone guess what the T in Root stand for? 
A team. Team. Team, right? Team mates. So teammates. And what kind of commitment is each player willing to make to one another? On and off the field, in or out of the classroom, when you're part of a team, your behavior outside may reflect on the entire team. And so respect for teammates, simply put, is just never act in a way that's going to embarrass your team. I mean, we've seen it at every level of competition, and it's sad, but really to remind our players um, that, hey, respecting teammates is making sure that we never act in a way that it will embarrass one another. And last but not least, can anyone guess the, the, the S? Um, self. Self, exactly. The most important of all is self. This means living in a way um, up to our own standards, even when others may not uphold it. And so just because, you know, even another team, because they're not doing it the PCA way, I'm still going to honor the what I, what I value, what PCA has to offer. And if we believe in honoring the game, then we show respect for roots, right, all of it, rules, opponents, officials, teammates, and self. And so I kind of want us to be able to get warm a little bit. We're going to get up, get the blood flowing, but we're all sitting here, so you just raise your hand. Um, but there's an excellent example, and so we're going to practice what it means to honor the game. We have a, actually a real-life scenario. If you guys didn't know, back in 2006, a local boy from Hawaii, his name was Ren Tanaka, um, was on the Gonzaga golf team. And so they were golfing in their conference championship, and um, as, as you know, in college golf, you play as a team. So you add up all your scores. Um, obviously, the team with the lowest score wins the championship. After the first day, Gonzaga was in first place, right? And so on the second day, Ren had hit a ball into this um, particular rough area where he actually hit another practice ball in. So um, he's there. He finds his ball. There's the Gonzaga logo, and it has his markings because golfers mark their ball to make sure that it's their ball. And so he picks it up and he continues playing, right? And so I'll, when he finishes the second day of competition, he shoots a 72, which is an awesome score, awesome score. Um, but he realized the ball that he was playing with was marked, um, still his, Gonzaga logo, but it was a number three. And him and his partner were playing with a number two ball. Mm. And so I just want us to kind of walk through this. But if you were Ren, what we've just learned in honoring the game, what would you do? And so there's four, four groups. Um, but the first one is like, hey, you just turn in the scorecard. I mean, it was in the same area, still the Gonzaga ball. It's my ball. It's just the numbers missing in. You know, we need to win this championship, right? That's option one. Option two, um, you tell your teammates first. Hey, I'm about to turn in my score, um, my scorecard. This is what happened. Three, um, you take a two-stroke penalty. You go to the official, like, hey, okay, I'll just I'll change my card and. You know, it would have been two strokes behind anyway, so I'll take the two-stroke penalty. Or four, you disqualify yourself. And along with disqualifying yourself, your whole team gets disqualified. Okay, so how many of you would be number one? Okay, number two? Team? Okay, so I just want to ask real quick before we kind of move on, but why, why number two? I think for me, it would be about deciding for everyone, even though I could decide for myself because you said there's a self portion on there. And I think a lot of times that's gray area, especially for teenagers, is where am I being selfish and where is myself actually standing out and being a leader? So I would need help as a teenager um, trying to decide this kind of um, complex situation. And I would want to include my team if I was close enough and we had built that relationship. That's a great answer, great answer. Kelly? I was going to say similar. I think because in this championship you have to play as a team, all of your scores are added in together. So mm -hmm. I'd want to make sure whatever decision I made, my team had my back on it. Awesome. And, and great answers. Can I just share um, what Ren ended up doing now? And so what Ren did, and this isn't to make anyone feel bad, this is just mm -hmm. what, what Ren did as he honored the game. He immediately took a disqualification. Wow. Right? He did that first, and then he told his team. And, of course, the teammates, they were upset. Um, you know, like, Ren, why would you do that, man? Like, we, we would have won this whole thing. Um, but there was one teammate in particular who said, hey, you know what, Ren, it's okay. I'm proud of you because on this team, we don't cheat to win. Mm -hmm. And it was so awesome to, to kind of hear about that. It made it back in the, on the local newspaper. Um, Sports Illustrated heard about it. ESPN heard about it. And the cool thing about it, 
um, whether you think this can relate or not, but a Fortune 500 company heard about Ren's story, and what they told him was it didn't matter what degree he was about to graduate in, but that they had a job waiting for him if he wanted to take it. Wow. Because they wanted, hey, um, the integrity that you have, those that's the kind of person that we want working for our company. And so, I mean, beyond what these athletes will experience in honoring the game, it's going to help them honor their life in every single area. And this is a great um, segue of, of the importance of what it means to build a team culture because, as we know, honoring the game, it doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't just happen um, with the snap of a finger, um, but it, it, it's intentional. You have to be intentional about uh, developing a culture that honors the game because it's so hard, even with this day and age, for, for the players. I mean, they see the professional level. It's a win at all costs. It's a business. And it's sadly trickling down into our youth sports. And so um, we encourage you as coaches, as leaders, to, to build and develop a, a team culture. Right? And we're encouraging youth sports organizations and their leaders to develop their organization um, with a healthy culture, a, game, a culture that honors the game in their respective leagues. Um, because the best way we find to define culture is how we do things here, the way we do things here. Because the culture of one company might be completely different from another, even if they're in the same business. Right? And so the way we, they might do things might be completely different from the other. And so this is an opposite, or not an opposite, but an awesome opportunity for us as coaches to start developing a culture that we want to see take place within youth sports, how we do things here. Because it's not a question of whether or not your team will have a culture. Your team's going to have one, right? It's just a question of whether or not um, it's going to be the one that you want and you desire. And to give us um, a practical tool to help us honor the game, and again, um, in this book, I'm, I'm going to point you back to it on page 46. It has a lot of practical tools, a toolkit um, to help you as coaches, parents, and players honor the game. But the sample tool I want to discuss is the self-control routine. Um, and, and we encourage you to develop a really good self-control routine because it's going to help you conduct yourself in a way, in a manner that you're going to be proud of um, when you face those times in games where it's like getting intense. Right, and, and no matter how much you intend to like keep your cool, there's going to be times where tempers arise, you want to clench your fist and just yell at the top of your lungs. Um, and these are going to be in crucial situations. And so what these help do, it doesn't help you react, but it's going to help you respond. Respond in a way that's going to, you're going to be proud of like, okay, that was good. But does anyone kind of have like a self-control routine that they use that they've seen effective? I always have a water bottle with me. So I'm constantly sucking on my water bottle if I'm feeling like getting nervous. I just kind of walk away and just take a nice long draw of my water bottle to cool myself off. Yeah. Anjali? Yeah. Uh, I think I, I, um, I verbalize that I need a moment. Mm. And then I walk away and then like pace for yeah. like a couple of seconds and then I'll come back breathe and then start talking again because my first thought is usually the wrong thought. <laughs> There's a, it's the emotions just going wild up in there, right? Yeah. So it, it's so good, and I love what you guys just said. A lot of um, a good one that I've heard too is just taking the mm. the deep breath, um, a big inhale, a big exhale, because um, an effective self control routine, what it does, it, it does two things. It distracts you, like you're saying, um, from this how I want to react. It takes you out of that moment, and it gives you a couple of valuable seconds, right? It's gonna be. Um, these two big seconds are going to help you respond. Not react, but respond. And we're going to respond in a way that we're going to be proud of, that holds up, that honors the game, um, that really represents, hey, this is what positive coaching is all about. And so with our last principle kind of um, wrapping up, I'm going to refer back to this Mallory moment. I'm going to talk about your Mallory moment because we, we have the potential to have Mallory moments every single day on and off the field, even within our homes and within our communities. And I want to read this quote from our PCA founder, Jim Thompson. He says, um, if you coach long enough, you will find yourself faced with your own big Mallory moment opportunities, maybe even more than once. But for sure, 
coaching provides a never-ending sequence of smallery, mallory moment opportunities. My challenge to you is by your actions time and again in those moments to elevate the game the way Mallory Holtman did. And so in these Mallory moments that we have, a bad call, a, a player being disobedient and not listening, a parent coming in your face and telling you, why didn't you run that play and said, why isn't my kid playing? That we would use these Mallory moments to honor the game, to elevate the game, um, and, and really represent what positive coaching is all about. Nice job. That was right on, exactly 20 minutes. Awesome. Yeah, that was fantastic. Great job, Brett. I'm, I'm very awesome. impressed. Thank that was, you. That was, that was one of the best I've seen. That was really very, very good. Oh, my very gosh. Well no pressure, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it's really cool because when Brett started into this course, he was a little nervous because he didn't have a lot of coaching experience. He's fantastic. And, <laughs> and what I tell people all the time is coaches with 30 years of experience don't necessarily make good workshop trainers. Everybody mm. thinks, you know, because I've coached forever, I, you know, I can do this. And, and, I mean, you just proved, you know, you have, what, one year of coaching experience <laughs> under your belt, but you just, you, you did a great job at, at energy and motivating us and passion and telling stories and using current examples and all of that stuff. I don't think, I mean, I didn't even think for a second that the fact that you have so little coaching experience had any relevance at all as the effectiveness of your workshop at all. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Um, Angelique, I wanted to just get your first impressions, and then I'll, and then I'll wrap up with some, uh, some feedback. I I, I'm with you on the energy. I think energy is important as a school teacher. I think that's the one thing we lose first. And we could get distracted with what he's saying, and that'd be nice, but none of it would matter if I, you had lost my attention. And mm -hmm. really, for adults as, as well as teenagers, energy is the one thing that keeps people pumped up and listening actively. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. I agree. That's the very two things I put down right away. Your energy and your smile are contagious. And it, it just shows your passion. Your passion shows through your body language. And the fact that you, you know, you were telling us, get excited about this because this is exciting. And if I knew this back when I was a player, um, you know, the whole trifecta, I mean, you got us energized. And that only took three minutes. It took you three minutes to do your intro. And I was excited. And I have heard 15 minute intros that I'm like, all right, come on, get to the point, you know? So I think it was a very good, effective use of getting us involved, getting us engaged, and going, okay, yeah, I want to hear more from this guy. This is awesome. Um, I thought it was very smooth. Like, you knew the content inside and out. I love how, you know, Angelique even asked you a question that kind of tripped, it would have tripped up some people, and you just went, you know what, let me get back to that. And that's going to happen so often. You're going to have that person that asks you a question, and you think, oh, hey, I have, to, I have to answer this person's question, and I thought you handled that really, really well, because that was so realistic for a workshop. So you did a great job with that, too. Um, I just love your storytelling. I think you did a great job with the storytelling. The, the going over the roots part, that is where people are usually very long-winded. And you went through all five of those in, like, four minutes. And that's awesome. And I don't think you rushed. I think your pace was good. But you hit every single point very clearly. I love the Karate Kid example. I think that's, that's such a great example, especially if, you know, martial arts is so big in Hawaii. But... I mean, even if I'm not into martial arts, most of us have seen Karate Kid, and you do every time. You see them bow to their opponent. But that was right there. You that was it. awesome. That was awesome. And not only that, that you, you, know, you brought up the point that it's to bring out the best. Your opponent is to bring out the best in you, and I think that's, that was very cool, too. Um, I love the question, how many perfect officials are there? I think that's a great question, besides, besides Angelique, who, of course, is one of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought that was great. Uh, the other thing that I, that I have been pointing out at a lot of these um, Google Hangout final that you did not do, which I'm really glad, one of the things that sometimes trainers fall into when you go to honoring the game is saying, this is what you have to do. You have to respect officials. You have to respect your opponents. You have to, and it, it almost becomes a lecture. And yeah. I really like the way you didn't do that. I really like the way you used honoring the game as framing a culture and setting the bar very high. And you did an excellent job at that. You, you explained honoring the game in terms of this is what we're going to be doing to make our team better, to make ourselves better, to make, you know, and I just think that was a really great, great thing to do. I didn't feel at all like you were trying to tell me, don't do this, don't do that. And uh, so I thought that was, that was fantastic. Um, okay, I need details on this Gonzaga golf story because that was amazing. I think that's the greatest story. I was writing down as many details as I could 
What was the player's last name? Um, Tanaka. So this is actually what I heard from Kihas. Okay. Um, thing. And yeah, so when we have the session, everyone goes into a corner of what they would want to do when we did the four scenarios. And so yeah. I didn't even know about this story either, but um, Uncle Kiha told me about it. Yeah. And I, I called him. I was like, hey, I'm doing this this final mock-up thing, and I want to use that I want to use that story. And so he kind of has it um, from his auntie, so it's a little more insider scoop. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, he... He um, hit the ball into the same area of the rough where he had his practice ball, and because um, I don't, he said I don't think the corporate 500 thing is in the story, but he's like that's that's what happened is they offered it, and to me it's kind of like it's awesome because it's so like his a, he knows or, this guy then he has he, know, he met he met the um the auntie yeah oh okay mm-hmm. and his name is it W R E N uh it's R E Y N oh R E Y N and the last name is Tanaka. T, do you know how to spell that? T-A-N-A-K-A. Okay, that was just, and what year was that from? Do you know? It was in 2006, so I actually tried to research it too. Yeah. Um, and it actually does, I mean, on, you know, like on Gonzaga's site from the archives, it says like, oh, you know, he shot this, but um, this, they were disqualified. It, what an yeah. awesome story. And I love how you made that into an activity. And, and I think that's a great, because I'm even looking at these four going, man, what would I have done? And and what would you want to do as a coach, and then what would you do as a player? Very thought provoking. I really I liked that a lot. Um, the only the only wishes, and I was trying to you know I have to always pull out some things that I'd like you to improve upon, Brett. And the only thing I would love to hear is a more personal story from you, um, your experience as an athlete, or maybe even in coaching young players. Uh, mm-hmm. Where's where's the time you've been challenged in this? Because I think it's a great thing that you're such an upbeat person, but it's always good to see the human side too. Saying, okay, where was I challenged in this? Where was this hard for me? Or, or as a player, this is a situation. Just to connect to the audience a little bit more. And um, the only other thing that I, and this isn't a critique, but this is something that I thought was really cool too. Um, someone brought up today that there's practical implications of honoring the game. And I wanted to share, I thought it was really interesting. They, they were talking about, um, you know, it, it raises the bar, it raises the level, but their coach always said, if you disrespect opponents, you're wasting time. And you're giving the opponent what they want. You're get your, if you get your feathers ruffled by an opponent by disrespecting them, the opponent is now one up, a, one up on you. Yeah. And I thought, that's kind of a good point for some coaches in the audience who are sitting there going, okay, Brett wants me to be a positive coach. He wants me to honor the game because it's the right thing to do. But I like the way she pointed out for those coaches that are like, all right, I want a practical reason for doing this. And you're giving your opponent an advantage by showing them disrespect. And I thought that was a neat point to bring up. So I was uh, very pleased, Brett. Nice job. Thank you. Ruben, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Hey, Ruben. Hi, Ruben. Hey, hi, hi, Brett. Hi, Angelique. All right. Angelique, you're up. All righty. Let me see if I can get that. I'm impressed by you guys. So high tech with all the screens in the background. <laughs> nice. There we go. That's a little bit better. Well, thank you, Kelly, for introducing me. Um, as you've heard, my name is Angelique Davis, and I am a 12 year sport coach. I've actually coached longer than I've actually played sports, <laughs> which is even more interesting. So I've learned more about athleticism off the field than I have on the field. And a lot of it has to do with the trifecta of triumph, which is the PCA philosophy. And of course, we talked about the elm tree tree of mastery, which is, you know, effort, learning, and mistakes. But tonight, we're um, we're gonna focus on one that really, really is a passionate point for me. And I've seen work effectively um, when applied, but unfortunately is one that seems to be the most challenging for a lot of the coaches on, out there. It's called filling the emotional tank. Uh-oh. Right here, filling the emotional tank. Does anybody know what an emotional tank is? Hands? Okay, so we know what emotions are. Okay, um, Kelly, we know what emotions are. What are emotions? Uh, just how you're feeling about something. 
Okay. So emotional tank, you know, we know tanks are usually tied to cars and, you know, what do we put in those tanks um, that make those cars go? Yes. All right. Way to go, Brad. <laughs> so um, if we're talking about emotional tank, then we're talking about we want emotions to fill up that tank to move us forward. Um, Ruben, do we want to fill our tank with bad gas? At, there's times in the 80s, and yes, I'm dating myself, where they used to water down the gas. <laughs> and uh, people used to make more money when the gas was thinner. Uh, but would your car run well? Or if no, you I want, put uh, I want, diesel I want good gas. <laughs> I want good gas. I want the right. I want the right kind of gas for my car. So, no, I don't. I don't want the diesel because I don't have a diesel engine, and I don't want that. Uh, that expensive ninety-one stuff. I go for you know, the the regular. The regular. Okay, great, great. Well, great answer. I really appreciate that, and thank you for coming. Um, I know you came in a little late, but we are all excited to have you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, well, so Ruben says we need the the correct. Uh, fluid for forward movement and the fluid that we're talking about with the emotional tank is how we communicate as people and the relationships we build. So we're going to move forward with that and get on top of that. So great scenario right here. Which car would you rather be driving? Well we'd all be you know, would be excited about driving an Aston Martin. I heard they got rid of 72 of them just for fun in the last James Bond movie. Ouch. Um, so this one's on E. An Aston Martin on E is just as good as a Toyota. <laughs> um, and then we have one that's full. So obviously we want to go with what car? Full. Full tank. Okay, full. So it's a simple concept. So. I don't want you to think that just because the concept is simple that I think you are simple. We're starting with basics and and relationships are basic to us but a lot of times we don't spend a lot of time growing them. So we want full because we want our car to run well. We want full because we want to go where we need to go. And in an empty tank you can't expect to go far. And in a full tank you can go a long way. So exactly what is the emotional tank when we're filling it? So what do we need to fill that up? One of the things that Ruben said that was excellent, thank you for your suggestion, is we don't want to fill it up with pessimism. What's pessimism? Simple word. Very being powerful. Down, being negative or being down on somebody. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest challenges as we build ourselves with teams is we get really comfortable with each other and we start taking each other for granted. One of my favorite skill sets is sarcasm. And the challenge with sarcasm is it often can go to pessimism really easily without even knowing it. So we need to be conscious about how we see each other, how we interact with each other, and how we don't go too far in a negative area because it has a direct effect. What the effect is, it forces people to give up easily. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? So, you guys are sitting here, you're listening to me talk. You could easily just walk out right now because you're like, ah, oh, emotional tank, I don't need that part. I'll come back when she starts talking about lacrosse or basketball or football. What is making you stay? Is it just the fact that I'm here with a PCA course and you're excited to see me and you heard all my fabulous background or one of your friends is here? What is really making you stay here? Well, if I if you walked in the door and I said, Ruben, you're wearing that striped shirt again. And you know, I really would rather see you in a turtleneck. If my first thought is to find something wrong with you, is that does that make you want to stay or does it make you want to go? Uh, I I don't want to. Uh, no, I'm. Uh, that turns me off. That's a turn off. Okay, but do you know why it's a turn off? Well, it's insulting. It's um. Yeah, it's 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 insulting. I think. Um, and those are the things that we don't always voice to in our communities in sports. We know how we feel, and we don't always articulate it. But we know that when we don't feel right about something, we don't want to buy in. A lot of people say that you you basically invest with your vote, your money, and your presence. And all of those things can be taken away when people aren't investing in you properly. And it makes you less coachable. And it makes my team non-existent. So I want to go with a fill in the emotional tank with optimism. 
positivity, dealing better with adversity, and making a person more coachable. So, that brings me to a wonderful story of why I am a PCO coach. The first thing I realized when starting to coach and taking a U.S. Lacrosse uh, PCA program was that this was optional to me. I really did come here just to learn, you know, to the U.S. Lacrosse Convention in 2008 just to learn lacrosse. And I had no idea why they forced us, and I say forced, to buy into this philosophy of positive coaching. Well, what did that have to do with anything? I come from, um, as I said earlier, I, I'm, I'm a little bit older than a lot of coaches, and I come from uh, a background where my coaches screamed at me. My coaches used to throw sticks at me because I played field hockey as well. Um, we used to run miles every time she got upset about anything. But we were winning. So how did her making us feel better have anything to do with that scoreboard? Board. So that ties us back into the whole PCA philosophy. Is It's about the greater win, not just the win on the scoreboard, but the win that's in the character of the player, the win that's in the connection of the team, the win that makes you want to work through the challenges that we talked about when we were talking about Elm Tree, you know, the effort, the learning, the mistakes. The thing that pushes us through the Elm Tree is the support and positivity of filling the emotional tank. It's there where we lower it when we're in times of trouble. But we don't want to empty it, and that means we need to make sure it's filled. So, 2010, I'm a sport coach at a local high school, and I'm developing my first program. I have three players. None of them know lacrosse. I have an administrator who doesn't believe that lacrosse is a real sport. I have a principal who gave me no budget, and I have to form a team in 30 days or else they will cut the whole program. You're listening to this. Tell me how you think I'm feeling. Am I feeling positive, coach? <laughs> Perfect? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so um, some of the things that I did were all administrative. I got the paperwork together. I applied for grants. Um, I reached out for more players, but I wasn't getting those positive type of feedback. So I went to my players and I said, well, we might have to play short. Well, lacrosse has a team full of 11 players and a goalie, and I have three players in front of me. Do you think that built up the energy of my players? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. Um, if you were a player, uh, Brett, how would you have felt when your coach is like, we have no team, we have no athletes? athletic director support and um, and we have no validation in the sports community. I'd be thinking of what other sport I can possibly play. <laughs> yeah, <game>. exactly. <laughs> well, you're <laughs> correct. That was exactly what I was dealing with under there. Um, so I actually, in the middle of uh, preseason, I went to the U.S. Lacrosse Convention, which is in December, and preseason, um, the season starts in March, and I, I took the course and the first thing uh, one of the representatives said is, this course will change the way you coach. This course will change your team dynamic. This course will change you. And I'm looking at him and I said, this course won't get me another 10 players. Um, but after going through the course and recognizing the importance of the principles of positive coaching, I implemented it because I had no other options. Um, so I went in and I told my three players, I said, you know what, we're going to teach you lacrosse, but I'm going to also teach you about character development. I'm going to teach you about how you push through in, in face of adversity. And I'm going to teach you how to use what you already know, and we're going to learn lacrosse. The girls looked at me like they were shocked. They were like, but we're never going to win this way. And I said, I want you guys to go out and I want you to find people and I want you to tell them why you love being on a team with only three people. And the kids went out and did that. I wrote to my athletic director and I told him that he was really, really um, a positive part of supporting us for the fact that we even had a team even though we didn't have all the supports. My athletic director started coming to our practices. I went to my principal and I said, you know what, I'm going to take my paycheck and I'm going to play I'm going to invest in our own athletic 
equipment. And my principal then was like, wow, she's investing in it. Maybe I should. So as I touched people and told them what was right instead of what was wrong, we started gaining more and more support over time. My team went from three players to 20 players by the next season. My uh, principal invested in uniforms for us within the next year, and my athletic director started wearing our team t-shirt in order to gain support. So that is a wonderful, succinct story of how it worked for me. But it doesn't work that way for everyone, because a lot of people think that starting with a positive phrase means not being honest with people about the realities. I was honest with the realities, but yet I still encouraged others to grow and develop because I was optimistic. And then I was able to deal better with adversity, including my teammates. Um, and that made everyone more coachable. So let's talk about what drains the tank. Ruben had said earlier it is putting the wrong items in your tank. Criticism and correction, sarcasm, one of my weaknesses, um, and a lot of people's weaknesses because we think that sarcasm keeps things light and funny, but it often drains the emotional tank of a lot of the players as well as uh, your colleagues like assistant coaches, principals, athletic directors. Ignoring and nonverbal, so it can also be very, very subtle when we don't support the people on our team. So this was the resource that changed my team for the next five to ten years. It was this magic ratio. And when I heard this, I laughed loudly. I was considering how they did the math on this being a math teacher. And I was like, what's a magic ratio? Five to one, positives to criticism. Who came up with that number? Where did it come from? So with five to one, basically what we're doing is before you start with a criticism. It's important that you first find five positive things you can notice about a person attitudinally, emotionally, um, team-wise, skill-wise before you give that criticism. I want you guys to work it as a group. I want Brett, Kelly, and Ruben, and I want you to think of five positive things about each other. So Kelly, your person is Brett, Brett, you are Reuben, and Reuben, you are Kelly. I want you to think of five positives. Now, whether you know them or not, just look at them. You've been with them for a little bit of the course earlier, and think about five positives you can say, and then give me one negative. So I'll give you about two minutes for that. What could you say positive about, especially about somebody who you don't really know that well? All right, that's We're down to a minute and a half. down to a minute. And as you determine your negative, be conscious that you don't know this person, but you, you want to have an objective view. Last 30 seconds. My favorite countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Who would like to start for me? <laughs> Kelly! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for volunteering yourself. 
You're welcome. Okay, five so positive we, things about Brett. Okay, yes. Okay, I said um, I love his smile. I think okay. he seems very friendly right off the bat. Um, he's got a lot of energy. He is young, which makes me think he's like really cool and up on all the, the cool things. So I think that's awesome. And he's got a really good sense of humor. Great. So, Brad, how do you feel about uh, what Kelly said about you? I feel great. Did you know all those wonderful things about yourself before? Um, yes and no. So. so your unsureness is kind of like you don't necessarily spend time focusing on how awesome you are. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> No, but the, how did, did you feel uncomfortable with her saying nice things to you? No, it, um, it definitely it, it boosts um, my confidence and like kind of like what you're talking about. If I had an emotional tank, like it's definitely a, a lot more. It's full. It's fuller. Kelly, tell us one thing that Brett could improve on. Uh, the only thing I could think of was that I don't know him very well personally. I've known him for seven weeks, but I don't know much about him as a person. I only know him from like a coach point of view or from the class point of view. So I think maybe he could be a little more, you know, a little more personal experience would be nice to get to know him a little better. So, okay, so you, he's still a stranger to you in a lot of ways? Um, some ways, yeah. Okay. And so, Brad, how do you feel about uh, that comment in lieu of the other ones? Do you feel uh, like you're standoffish, shy? <laughs> No, I, I I think I thought it was I thought it was completely valid, and I didn't I, I didn't feel offended as she shared it. Like I thought it was it was truthful, so it was I thought it, I thought it was it was fine with me. Okay, so as long as it's truthful, you can take criticism. Yeah, but she did it in a gentle way too. It was like very gracious, so it's not it wasn't like oh yeah he's like a stranger he's like weird and stuff. But it was it was like kind of like sandwiched a little bit. So I was like good. Oh. Mm. Boom, yeah. Wow, all that positive coaching, probably. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so, Brett, I'd like you to share yours with Ruben, but I want you to start with your negative. Man, I, 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 I couldn't really think of a, a negative because I've only, I think Ruben and I have only been in maybe two two or three sessions with one another, um, but I would definitely have to um, agree with kind of the similar thing with what Kelly said about me was just you know I just love to get them get to know them a little better on a personal level. Yeah. yeah. So we're all coming to your house, Ruben. Yeah. <laughs> You're <So>. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so tell him one good thing that you know about him, uh, Brett. Just one. I wrote it. I wrote. I didn't realize this, but I wrote it down twice. So I really, I really enjoy how Ruben always smiles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, he does have a great smile. I, I can hear his smile in his voice a lot of times, too, um, since I've talked to him over the phone a lot. So you've actually gone one-to-one -one versus Kelly's five-to-one. Ruben, if we continued with negatives, do you think that you would still feel as positive as you did when he just said he loves your smile? No. No, no. I think I would uh, quickly forget about that positive and focus on the, the negatives. So the balance of the math has something to do with how we receive it. And whether we know how to count in math or we're math teachers or we're just living life, those numbers, we can feel them emotionally, but we can't necessarily uh, measure them factually. Ruben, can you give Kelly your five? Give, give Kelly my five? Yes, sir. She Did was you your she okay. was your person. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, very easy to do, by the way, uh, because mm -hmm. Kelly is tremendously hardworking. She gets stuff done. Uh, she uh, she has put together a wonderful trainer training course. So that 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 could be many positives if I broke that one down. Uh, she's really good at problem solving, and she's and she's uh, flexible. She she can be flexible. Great. So Kelly, how are you receiving that? I feel great. Excellent. No negatives either, right? Not so yet. We have <laughs> tonight, and Ruben said that to you, whether he was your boss or your partner or your colleague, you're good to go. Yeah, I feel great. So, 
basically what we're saying is there's there's a formula for making other people feel fabulous and it helps with the buy-in of getting them to do some of the challenging things that aren't so wonderful and that five to one is the perfect ratio of how we convince people that they are awesome enough to get things done in spite of the challenge that challenges that are in front of them um, this fabulous book right here the power of double goal coaching I'd love for you since you guys all have it to flip to your page 32 and I want you to see a little bit about the magic ratio let's see Ruben can you read the first paragraph research yes. shows. research shows I don't want you to walk out of here and not use this book it, the, the spine sure. will be cracked when I'm done <laughs> research shows on page okay Kelly are we okay for time should I read she's got one minute left one minute. Okay. Research shows. Research shows that the optimal ratio of tank fillers to criticisms is five to one. University of Washington professor John Gottman calls this the magic ratio. I love that name because you do see magical things happen as you get close to five to one. Thank you very much. So it is not only that we are using this as emotional approach to encouraging other people to feel better about what they're doing it's not only an emotional approach to getting our teams to work more effectively together it's not only an emotional approach to working better with our colleagues but it is an approach that has been actually researched and is validated by the sports community um, are there any questions mm -mm. so I would love for you to review the rest of this chapter in your free time now that you've started reading your book and and practice the five to one during our break which we're going to have before we move on to our next area which is honoring the game thank you mm -hmm. well done all right nice job That was great. That was the most I've ever seen you. That was awesome. <laughs> a lot of times on the Hangouts, you were hard to see and hard to understand. I know. So I was like in murky darkness. <laughs> yeah. No. It was. It was great. To, it was great to get to know you a little bit better, Angela. Like I thought that was that was well done. That was very well done. Ruben, would you like to start, or would you like me to start? But why don't you start, Kelly? Okay. Uh, and I'll add. Okay. Actually, I'd like to hear first impressions from Brett. What did you think, Brett? I thought it was um, same thing. The high energy. So even if I were to came in a workshop and I had a long day, it woke me, woke me up right away. Um, and I love like, and when you're breaking down the um, the tanks of like what you you went into detail of like sarcasm, um, which helped me because sometimes when I just hear you're pessimistic, I'm like, oh, what does that mean? But you know, you added the the and your own personal experience of sarcasm too, which helped me relate to you. Mm -hmm. Helped me relate to you. Um, so and and I saw that as like a personal conviction of how I can look into my own life. Like, oh yeah, what can I do? You know, with my players, my coaching staff, um, to be able to be less sar sarcastic. And then I also liked how you. Um, I didn't know about the the gas thing. Sorry, I wasn't around back in back in during that time frame. But um, <laughs> now I know. But it was like a good example of like, oh yeah, you want to be filling it with good stuff, not bad stuff, because you you can fill your tank with anything. So I thought that mm -hmm. was a really great example and how you were smiling a lot through the whole thing as well yeah I agree I agree awesome all right um, I have the, some of the same things I think your energy right off the bat your smile your energy you got me you got me excited to be there I thought your sense of humor right off the bat you know talking about an Aston Martin versus a Toyota like it's as good as a Toyota I think that's a really good point to, to bring up and even like you know did you know they they trash 72 Aston Martins. Like, I think that's a really good, you know, just little little tips like that are what kind of wake people up. Like, all right, she's got a personality. She's she's here to have a good time. I think that's very good. Um, I thought your personal story about the, the lacrosse convention, and I think the way you were, you were so convicted, the way you came across, and you were so honest and transparent about, like, I literally laughed out loud when I thought they were, they told me I was going to change the way I coached. I mean, I think that's, that's just so true to who so many of us are as coaches. So that, to me, makes me want to listen to you. My caution would be to try to get that story, which ended up being about six minutes, yes. to get it down a lot shorter. I felt that. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know that's a, that's something that you need to work on too is just you know making things Thanks. shorter. But and I, and Ruben has said this to people too. Just practice, practice saying the same story. See if you can do it 
like go the other extreme. Can you tell the whole story in two minutes? And okay. then, you know, if you need a little bit more, maybe add three minutes. You know, like but, but Right, and then try to see if you can tell it in one minute. I bet you could tell the story in one minute without necessarily speeding up. Just hit the main points, then you can always add on to it later. But I think I think the power of that story is great. The power of the struggling team with three players. Yeah. I mean, I think that was just a. It was a great example of, and and even some of the quotes I wrote down. Um, you know, I focused on what was right, what was then what was wrong. Think of how many people in your situation would have just gone and complained, and and the fact that you didn't, and it actually built up, and you said to these three girls. You know, we're going to work on character development. We're going to work on what it means to be a team. We're going to, you know, all those life lessons that you talked about when we did the life lessons portion. I thought that was that was really Kelly, strong. Yeah, Kelly, um, I, I I was wondering about the the story also, um, so um, I wanted to jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, Angelique, if you had to, you, you know, the story you, you covered a lot, you know, and I think you made a lot of points. But if you were to pick out the one main point that that story is supposed to drive home or illustrate the one main point, what would it be? I think for me it's about changing myself so I can change other people. Okay, so my if you had, if, if, I, I have a feeling if you asked Brett what was the main point of the story, you asked Kelly, you oh, asked me, gotcha. that we wouldn't have said that. Okay? okay, because there was so much that I think that main point you know, may have gotten lost with many other points. So, um, you know, I think, so, so think about that as you work on how you're going to utilize that story, how you're going to whittle it down. Okay. What, what is the one main takeaway I want from this and story? And repeat it over and over again so people can subliminally get it, so that way... I, I don't know if you have to repeat it over and over, but, you know, for example, if you say, when I coached a lacrosse team and I was given three players, no budget, and told... Uh, the season's going to end, you know, I, and then what was your main point again? That that, uh, that that I had to transform as a coach, and this transform, you know, whatever whatever your main okay. point is, make I had to it. Transform myself. Don't, so don't, I don't, transform don't let myself. it get, mm -hmm. be careful about it getting hidden and covered up with too much detail and, and, and too long a story, quite honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's perfect. I actually, I was concerned about that, so thank you. Okay. That's mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I thought that's that's a very good point to make. And and again, you know, I don't want it to to um, deter your storytelling because you're a very strong storyteller. You know, the details are good to add to the story. Yeah. So I think that's a good suggestion. You know, stick to the focus, the the point. Um, I liked your activity too with the with the magic ratio. I thought that was a strong activity. Um, uh, what I would not have done is told us the magic ratio first. Um, you told us okay. the the five to one oh. ratio. And then went through the example. I think the, the the example in and of itself was it was a really good one, and it was neat for me to sit here and think, gosh, five positive things, and then one critique of Brit. Um, that was hard to do, but it was really good to see the way you kind of unpacked it and said, how'd that make you feel? And then Ruben only got a one to one. How'd that make you feel? And then you know maybe for my example, you just gave me positives. Maybe you know you would say, well, how would that be if we were only positive? You know, would Kelly get any better if she was just told by? her coworker, boss, only positive things. So maybe bringing up that, again, is an example. Um, I think, personally, you gave us too much time. I like the way you did time management and saying, okay, 30 seconds, you know, whatever. But some, it's amazing how adults, when given a task and given only one minute time, they can get the same task done. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I really encourage, whenever you do group work, I don't make it any longer, usually, than about one minute because people just, you know, they take as much time as you give them. So I think you should just make it a little bit shorter. But I loved the idea of the activity. I thought it was I thought it was a strong idea. I have a question, um, Kelly. Yeah. Um, my question is, would asking a person to evaluate another stranger be uncomfortable for them, and they wouldn't do this effectively? I mean, we kind of know each other, but mm -hmm. would this not work because people wouldn't want to be mean overtly? I'll, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at answering that, Kelly. Go ahead. I'll, I'll Go take ahead. a stab at answering that. Um, and, and please add, Kelly. Um, so, yes, so I think it would be difficult if two people didn't okay. know each other, you know. Okay. So, so how, but what if you still wanted to do it? Well, maybe you could say, I want you to think about um, hmm. a player on your team. Right. And I want okay. you to, you know, and, and I want, and then I want you to give that feedback to your partner as if they were Tommy or as if they were Sally. Okay. So it, that, that depersonalizes it. 
but it, it it makes it it keeps it real because mm -hmm. they're talking about a real person. Okay. So that, that that's what came to my head as you asked that question, Angelique. Mm -hmm. I actually like that idea better because then it makes it real to their team. Mm -hmm. Think of a player that you know. Maybe think of the your your perfect player, the player that you love to have on your team the most. You know how easy and simple is it to give five positives right off the bat and one critique, one one piece of criticism. Now think of a player that's the most challenging for you. Wow. Now can you give them five positives? I mean that that might oh, be like a neat way to do that. Yeah, that might be a neat way to do it too, just to see how challenging it is to, to take that player that's a pain in the neck. Can you still give them five positives? Okay. But you know, it makes them really, really challenges them. Um, but I, I like the creativity. I thought that was a, a neat idea. So you know, to wrap it up, I would say things to focus on, as you know, just just making it more succinct. Mm -hmm. You know, cutting down your stories. I love the way you got us involved in your energy. I thought you did a nice job. Okay, thank you, Ruben. Did you want to wrap it up? Yeah, yeah, just, I mean, uh, uh, w when we talk about the magic ratio, I encourage all trainers to make sure that it is communicated as a target and goal over the course of time. Mm -hmm. And that it, it's okay to do an exercise where you give five to one. It, that, that is okay. As, as Kelly pointed out, there's great value in that. We want to be careful, though, that it's not misunderstood that every instant of coaching, every, every interaction... It, it is. It's not. It's. It is five to one. You know. It's no, no. Over the course of time, this is the ratio. Does that make sense, Angelique? Yeah, because it, I know I find myself some days not having criticisms for my players. And there's some sometimes days, we have to say, "Run, run to the base." You exactly. Know, the sometimes one. my criticisms are, are <laughs> outweigh it. But I hear myself when I'm doing it. I'm like, okay, I told her four times that she needs to fix these different things. I probably need to say something that balances out. But sometimes. For me, it's a push, and then the next day I might balance it out again. Okay. Balance okay. over time, you know, mm -hmm. and balance over time. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and then, um, and then uh, with the the slide that is uh, pessimistic, gives up easily, uh, yeah. Yeah. less coachable. Mm -hmm. the, the, remember, that's a slide of the the characteristics that an athlete has with an empty tank. Characteristics they have when their tank is full. It's okay. not meant to be the slide of how you fill and how you drain. It's not meant to be the slide that you fill someone's tank with optim, uh, optimism, you drain it with pessimism. That comes on the next slide. Okay, I've the missed tank you. Tank fillers and tank drain. These are characteristics of someone with an empty tank and a full tank. And and I, I felt you wavered between the two. You know, with, with pessimism and optimism, it, it sounded like you were talking to us, this is how you fill a tank. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page there. All right, so if you can see, can you see my screen? Yes. So this is the one that is the characteristic, and this is the one is the action of how to maintain it. Yeah. Okay. How, how to fill and drain, yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay, and then, so, so those are two small suggestions, but boy, I'll tell you what, um, your personality, Angelique, your energy, your enthusiasm, you have a wonderful speaking voice. I mean, it's really pleasant to to hear you and you're, you're easy to follow, easy to understand. Um, gosh, just so so much, so many positives you bring as a trainer. And then uh, just just one one detailed highlight. I really like. I thought one of the most powerful phrases you gave with the, with, with uh, gave us was, "This was the resource that changed my five years as a coach." Mm -hmm. Wow. I thought, okay, wait. I want to know. I want to know about this. Mm -hmm. I really like that 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 phrase that you chose there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, too. I appreciate it. These were both two really strong outings, and it, it's exciting for us to, to see you guys just really bringing your own personality into these workshops. It's my favorite part of what I do is I, I say half the time I'm, I'm trying to write down feedback for you guys, and half the time I'm stealing ideas. So it's, uh, I've, I've got plenty of writing in here, and it's not all critique, believe me. A lot of it's uh, stealing ideas. So. You both did a really a really strong job, and I'm excited to see where you go with this with with PCA and uh, and adding you both onto our team. Thank you, Kelly. Congratulations, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank and you. I will be in touch, and I'll let you know the next steps, guys. All right, Kelly, thank you. Yep. Kelly, do you have one more minute with, to stay on with me? Sure. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Have a great thanks. night. All right, thanks, guys. Okay. 
I'm going to shoot it to you straight. Um, this is this is actually the, the third time I've seen Brett, and I think um, I feel really good about Brett. Brett was awesome. Um, this, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, I, and he, you know, I didn't see him today, but I'd seen him twice before, and mm -hmm. he was good the first time. He was even better the second. I think I told you in an email that he, he strikes me as this little, this miniature or uh, uh, clone of, of Kiha, which is a compliment, right? Yeah, well, Kiha, <laughs> Kiha I mean, worked be, with him. He told me that yeah. Kiha's been working with him this week, and uh, you can tell he's he's really. Yeah, I mean, it'd be the same thing if someone goes, oh, well, she's she's a clone of Kelly Kratz. That would.